Welcome to Blue Grit Radio, the podcast that explores making better cops for a better community. I'm your host, Eric Tong. I've been an active police officer since 2007. We will dive into the aspects of police culture, health and wellness, leadership, and mindset. You'll hear from experts not only from policing, but all industries as they relate to being our best with purpose, passion, and positivity. Join me as we share stories, lessons, and advice so we can all be better for ourselves, our teams, our families, and our communities. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Blue Grit Radio podcast. And this is your host, Eric. Today I'm joined by today I am joined by none other than the John Kelly, a retired Broward County Sheriff's Deputy. And John, thanks for coming on the show. It's good to reconnect with you. Hey, Eric, it is absolutely my pleasure, my friend. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, John and I got connected through mutual professional acquaintances. That's that's the beautiful thing that I found in the law enforcement world, right? Uh, I had the the gracious experience of working in different units, which took me outside of my city, right? Took me outside of my county. But then in the social media space and the world today, whether it's LinkedIn or whether it's social media in general, like just to be able to connect with cops, leaders from all over, across the country and beyond internationally. It's been a really humbling experience, and you are one that I am very gracious to, or I'm very grateful to have your acquaintance and be able to go on your show relatively recently and continue that conversation, man. No, likewise. uh, You know, like you always hear the negative about social media, right? This is why it was founded, right? So people could connect that would never normally have the chance to have an in-person type relationship. So Yeah. yeah, man, we're using it the right way. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, that's going to be a theme that we're going to talk about, right? We're going to talk about wellness, leadership, ownership. Those are big tenants for you. You are the law enforcement life coach. We're going to get into that as well. But uh, cool. yeah, talking about social media, it's so much about our framing and what we choose to do with things, right? Social media is a tool. It's a thing. And, uh, you know, I recently interviewed Lisa Jaster. She's one of the first three Army Rangers who's a woman. And she gotcha. looks at social media and totally this positive light, right? She's just like, her daughter has it, you know, she's in tune with it. And at the same time, you you can recognize all the negativity, all the toxicity, but we can choose what we expose ourselves to and how we interact with that, such as we can with the world. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, listen, I like what you said. It's a choice, right? I limit, like if I'm, if I'm on social media, it is, it's for a purpose. Mm -hmm. It's to connect, to share, or, or to get some information. Uh, that mindless kind of looking at reels and, you know, uh, no, ab- no, you, you, you're, you're killing brain cells, you know, you, you, <laughs> yeah. you, you're no better for it. So that's kind of like the litmus test. Like, are you better for it, what you're doing? And as long as I think you stay with that lens, man, it's, it's a win. As long as we don't get involved with that mindless scrolling of content that doesn't add value to our lives. And we're, you know, we're all good. It's just, you know, we need to be very intentful when we engage with social media. There's got to be a reason behind it. If not, you'll be on the damn thing all day and you won't get anything accomplished. No, that's a good point. And I even find myself, you know, kind of into, it's a slippery slope, right? And it's right. just knowing your boundaries and your barriers, right? Some people don't have a really good left, right limit on whatever it is, right? For some people, it's food. For some people, it's shopping. Some people, it's alcohol. And so it's know thyself, right? Be introspective and invite that maybe feedback, critique, right? From your closest loved ones, because especially with this job, which we, you know, we'll talk about and we, it's really the whole conversation here, right? Uh, With all the stressors, we are so susceptible to those lines being blurred and slipping off one way or the other. Oh yeah, 100%. Listen, there's a lot of ways to detach and escape, right? And and I and I believe, you know, social media, that plat f- fills that void. If, if you're looking for a place to get lost, um, it's right there at your fingertips, right? You're, right you, know, you don't have to go far. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, we've seen this, right? We've had we've we've been in rooms where, you know, people are engaging with each other. And then there are people completely dialed in on that phone man to the to the exclusion of everything else going on around them um and i think that that's that's problematic yeah it's dangerous for sure and we talk about you know intention and attention like what are you paying attention to 
And, you know, it's a relevant conversation on this show frequently. Like, are we, are we being intentional with our family? And that's something mm. I continually have to work at. And so I'm not, this whole podcast is not to say I know best, right? It's to say, hey, I've, I'm learning lessons and I'm continuing to learn every day. There's days I do better at A and B and days that I suck at C and D. Uh, yeah, it's man. just to share that, right? To have the conversation and have people on such as yourself that, you know, wealth of experience, knowledge, not just the job and what to do about it, right? How to navigate that. Um, you know, you've got your book, you're a coach, you're a speaker. And so, yeah, let's just dive into that. You know, you wear so many hats now in retirement. Congratulations, <laughs> by the way. Thanks, man. Yeah, I know. You, you made it. Oh my God. 30 years, brother. 30 years. Mm -hmm. That's respectable, man. Um, it, especially when it, it's going to be more and more rare now. I, I think... Well, I think maybe more and more, I mean, that's a, going down a rabbit hole on, on the why maybe mm -hmm. people don't stay in this profession as long as they um, can. Um, but yeah, a lot of different hats. I, I, and you know what? I'm not done, man. I'm not like, so I did 30 with the help of a lot of people. You know, a lot of people had my back. A lot of people cared. But this second chapter. I mean, I'm like a sponge, man. It's all about making connections, continuing to grow and to really become excellent at something that is different. Like I, I, I want to become excellent at connecting with people mm -hmm. and adding value to their lives. Like that's the mission, man. Um, and, and on the job, that wasn't the mission. <laughs> it wasn't mm -hmm. the mission for 30 years. And so it's, it's a, it's a refreshing for me, a refreshing pivot that keeps me excited to wake up in the morning. I love that, man. And I generally don't have a lot of questions. I generally have a couple bullet points of themes or loose questions I want to ask. But that was one of them, man. It was, it was what prompted this growth and this expansion of your different businesses and different hats you wear. And where is it, where is it coming from? Where is it going? And you hit on a lot of that just now. Yeah, you know what, Eric? So the whole concept really about this second chapter was I felt a moral obligation, right? Like if you figure something out, brother, if you if you if you've got the key to how to do something the right way the first time, I think it's incumbent upon you to share that with our brothers and sisters. I mean, mm -hmm. There are a lot of people that figure some stuff out and they keep it to themselves, which I think is a shame because because I think that there's there's so much value that we have to offer each other that that only happens if we connect. We become comfortable being uncomfortable, maybe comfortable being vulnerable. If connection was not your mission uh, during your law enforcement career, no. what was? You know, I, I think we get comfortable with the people that we're with. And anybody that we're that's not with us, even if they're not even from, never mind law enforcement, but people that aren't on our squads or from our departments, I don't ever remember a sense of wanting to connect. Uh, it was like, and it didn't make sense, Eric. We like I circled the wagons for no reason, yeah. and it, it it was completely at my own detriment. Um, and I didn't just do that with the general public because you know. Certainly not going to let them in the circle, mm -hmm. but even people from other jurisdictions and other agencies, uh, we, yeah. we, I think you check me on this, but I think we're, we're, we're very tribal, bro. Oh yeah. Yeah, for sure. No. And uh, I asked that not as a, not as a point at you at all. It was very right. much in reflection of my own career. And for sure there's like ebbs and flows of when I was better at connecting. Uh, I mean, mostly later in my career more recently right but you know we talk about the public for sure that wasn't a prime goal of mine or a mission of mine early on and now i it, i kind of cringe to say that because public service should be and i hope sure. that so many people recognize that but yeah you're right like i can think of in you know in my own department in my region where certain agencies you know you kind of you know there's a smack talk and there's the friendly part and then there's also just the apprehension and then even you know department units there's been years where I think we can all reflect where we were more siloed and sometimes maybe intentionally or more guarded. Yeah. Right. And so sometimes it comes to a style thing and then becomes like a judgment. Oh, this crew does it better. And so we don't, you know, we hate going on calls with that crew because they do it all messed up. Like right. I know that exists in so many different cultures. No. And then you start, you know, I just, it, it, 
it was always, um, I don't know if it was because we weren't, we, maybe we lack some confidence. Mm. Like, cause if you're confident in what you're doing and like, then somebody else coming in somebody or, 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 um, requesting assistance. It's like, it, it completely transfers over into your personal life. Doesn't it? Like if, if you're confident in who you are, then, and you're okay with like conducting a real self analysis, you can mm-hmm. go, you know what? Uh, I kind of suck at that. Maybe I should bring somebody in to help me with that. Cause, um, there's no shame in that. Right. But we don't ever, we don't ever become comfortable with that. Like in, in our professional lives. So we're, if we can't become comfortable and have some humility in our professional lives, I don't think we'll ever achieve that in our personal lives. It's like, yeah. that would be the easier ask right at work. Hey, Hey man, you're, you're a DRE or you've got this background, you know, what the hell am I looking at? Mm. Or, and, and, you know, if you relate that to your personal life, maybe, you, you know, maybe you're having some financial struggles and like, well, maybe, maybe somebody with a financial background should put eyes on this and give me some direction. And yeah, yeah. We, I, yeah. I think there's something to that, that train of thought, because what you're, what I'm hearing is the discussion of humility. Right. And I felt coming to this job, you know, at 21 years old, like I felt like I had to know it all or give the guys of knowing it all. <laughs> yeah. Right. And so you show up with a certain way and you show up with a certain energy and it, it becomes this very fragile, you know, aura or shell of confidence that most people see right through, especially like people that have lived some life, you know, so they're right. they pick you apart. Whereas, you know, frequently I see a lot of strong officers, you know, whether they go to the scene with other officers or just like the general public they're like hey like that's a really good question i have no idea like i do not do that in my day-to-day right so you have a general patrol uh officer in my area it's pretty steady right so they might get asked some obscure traffic law and they'll say yeah i don't know like i'd I'd love to know but we have to look that up because we don't deal with the day-to-day but the traffic dude or gal will will be able to rattle off all of that off like verbatim just yeah. humility, right? And then I think people, when you level them, like they they open up and they see you as a person, and they're they're fine with it. And, and that Eric, in and of itself, uh, our, our ability to do that, I think, endears people to us, right? Because mm-hmm. um, we're all helpers by nature. We all want to solve problems. And what's what's the one of the best ways that I can align and 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 bring you on board with the mission? is to say, Hey brother, man, put some eyes on this. I, I think, I think I know which way to go on this, but I I want you to confirm that for me. Oh shit, man. You're asking for my help. Uh, I'm, I'm in, I'm yeah. in, what are we doing? Right. Versus, uh, Hey Eric, I need you to go do this. So, fuck, you know? Okay. Uh, so I think like on, on many levels, us, us showing, right. Displaying some humility, Um, and I think that gets paired, it can get paired with vulnerability, right? Hey, I, uh, absolutely. I don't know it all. Um, I'm a work in progress. And, you know, I think that that just, it bodes well for us across the board, whether it's our relationships at home, our relationships at work, our finances, our physical and mental health, there is always somebody out there doing it better that we can learn from, right? Constant, never-ending self-improvement. And it's really, it's got to start with you being okay with not knowing. Yeah. Yeah, and that's huge. And, you know, if we talk about the work context and, you know, the the word that's kind of like shooting out in my brain is trust, right? So we talk about uh, defensive posturing or uh, a lack of apparent willingness to receive feedback. But usually right. that, that lack of vulnerability is the defensive mechanism because they feel attacked, right? And why would someone feel attacked if you're, if you're just trying to be constructive? And it's because they don't know where you're coming from, right? And so maybe yeah. that's a, a gap in communication. Maybe that's a gap in a relationship. And that does translate back at home, right? That communication, we, we know, you know, we talk about uh, relationships. That's almost always the, you know, the overarching thing, you know, it's, it might not be finances is like the reason for a lot of split ups, but it's 
the lack of communication that led us towards these financial decisions and these in, you know, the lack of communication in these purchases, that's the thing. That's the thing that dissolved trust and connection. You know, Eric, I, I, uh, I have a thing when I present it, 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 it applies universally across the board. If we can't have conversations about the little things, we'll never have them about the big things. Right. Sure. And so if I can't come to you, I can't come to my spouse and have a conversation about what I want, actually, what I, what I want, what I actually desire. If I have to avoid that conversation because I think that by getting involved in a conversation, it's going to turn into an argument and I don't want to disrupt the moment. I don't want to have an argument. So you know what? The best way not to have an argument is not to talk. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. If we don't, if we don't talk, we never argue. Yeah. You know? Avoidance, right? Avoidance a hundred percent. So, you know, w- when that becomes the go-to, then we allow all these little things, man, all these little annoyances. Let's call them annoyances because they're not heavy duty yet. But when you start stacking annoyances on top of each other, it gets Mm -hmm. to the point, man, where indifference creeps in. And you're, you know what, you know, you're just like, you know what, I'm done. You're like, what, what just happened? (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) What, 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 you know, and then, you know, then you end up losing your mind over, the last little annoyance, but it's really not that annoyance. It's the 10 other things that month that you never addressed. Um, So one of the things that like I I focus on is really getting us to a point where we're comfortable having uncomfortable conversations. Yeah. And um, not, you would think it would be easy for all the things that we do at work. Like we're experts at identifying issues uh, resolving conflicts between warring parties, the Hatfields and McCoys. I mean, mm-hmm. we, we, we walk into that scene and we resolve it, right? Um, but we, we don't do that, man. We don't do that in our own lives. And and part of this whole mission is really trying to get us to be able to apply the skill sets that we employ at work mindlessly, automatic, to for us to be more in tentful to apply those same skill sets in our personal lives. Yeah. I think, you know, God, you know, if we could do that, man, we could, we could really add value. Like I, I'm sick. Now you get me all jacked up. Now I, I am sick. What did I do? I didn't do anything. Yeah, bro. In a good way, brother, in a good way. Yeah, I am yeah, yeah. sick of the stereotypical, like it will, you know, if you are going to be in this line of work, this is, it's, you know, this is going to be your life. You, mm-hmm. We need to stop that cycle. We're like this, we're in this abusive relationship in law enforcement mm. where like, it's like the domestic you go to that, you know, let's just say the woman ends up getting the shit kicked out of her every other, other month. And you keep walking up to her going, well, you know, what's it going to take for you to leave? Or, mm-hmm. or what's it going to take for the situation to get better, right? And we we've got this, we've got this segment of our profession that I think is given up, and they've said basically that if you're going to do this job, it's going to ruin your life. You're going to have you're going you know you're going to have all these problems. You're going to ha- suffer from PTS. Your your marriage, if you have one marriage, it's not going to be a healthy one. It's going to be shit. Uh, so you're going to probably have two or three marriages. Your kids are going to hate you. Uh, you're going to die in early, uh, gr- you know, end up in an early grave because you don't take care of yourself. You eat like shit. You don't pro, and you go, well, it becomes a self fulfilling prophecy. Yeah, I think. Why, I think. Why try? Right. Right. And so I think that it's so important for us to call that bullshit out and go, no, right. You have a choice, right. Mm -hmm. You have a choice. It's your choice to not cope. It's your choice not to be educated. It's your choice to be indifferent. It's your choice not to give a shit about the people on your squad. Um, And I think when we do that, when we start holding each other accountable for choices, I think we can change the culture. Yeah, that's huge, man. You, you've dropped a lot of bombs, uh, acknowledged bombs. That I want to uh, kind of highlight and expand on some things that popped into mind. And yeah, I absolutely. think, you know, in some, you're absolutely right. And that, that 
that victimhood mentality is what it is, right? We Ooh. we think we're so tough, heavy, and bro, we, yeah, heavy. And, but I'm gonna say, yeah, like that that uh, that cynicism, that level of apathy. It's it's victimhood. It's saying it's like not, I'm yeah, gonna don't, resign. You know what? It's not. I'm glad you're self corrected because it's not cynicism. It's playing the victim card. Oh, the old yeah. war was me bullshit card. Yeah, I think it bleeds into, you know, one bleeds into the other. And, I, you know, I was just working on a post, you know, writing about this, but it, it's a lack of resilience, right? If we're going to be adaptable and we're going to grow and we're going to deal with adversity, then, yeah, we deal with the licks. It's not to say we don't stumble at times. It's, just, it's not to say that we don't right. get knocked down, but, you know, you get back up. And it's so much of that is a choice, right? There are a lot of things that we can't control. And the stress is part of the job, right? But we can control stress management skills. We can control whether we try them. You know, we can control whether we, we hit up these resources, right? Like a, a financial advisor or an accountant or a trainer, right? And so, you know, we talk about you know, oftentimes, I, I keep s- still hearing it, but, you know, we're a bunch of type A's. We're a bunch of, no, we're not. I mean, we, we, we like to say we're type A's. We like to say that we all have tough skin. But the majority of people that say that I have found. They don't like they are pretty sensitive, right? A lot of people come to this culture and this this calling because they want to serve because they have this heart for service. And so right. they're not like they're not just, you know, stoic face, like hardened souls, right? That right. things don't just roll off their back. Um, I've had a lot of guys work for me through the years, different people that said, hey, you know, and when we talk about expectations and how they like feedback, a lot of people said, hey, just shoot straight. Tell me, tell me straight up. But when you do that, it does generally not. Wait a minute. I didn't really, when I said that, I didn't mean for you to be honest. I have found in my time, you know, I've been a supervisor, what, like six-ish years. But even as like a field trainer, right, back when, uh, you know, for the people that say they want you to shoot straight, it's generally not true in my experience. And I've heard other people echo that. They want you to shoot straight if they're expecting a positive. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Tell value. Me, yeah, they want, yeah, shoot me straight, man. Yeah. And in the back of their mind, they're they're expecting uh, some sort of kudos or job well done. Yeah, but I have found that the people that say that, I gen- generally have to game plan how I want to bring it up. What's the setting? Right. Like, what's the tone? Um, you know, is it a, not to say space is, a, is kind of a trigger word for people, but they're like right. a, a neutral ground, right? And like a right. the timing has to be just right. And I have to come at it with, sharing like really the intent and showing compassion and usually that only really works with time uh built up where you can build that trust over time yeah it's um it's getting back to trust like you need to know what my intent is and the only way you know what my intent is without me having to state it clearly is trust is is some history as me i I was reading something the other day you know that that trust um that capital man i mm. I, I think i'll probably stealing something from jocko here but you know he talks about you know having that 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 um a, a certain measure in reserve like that like an like a bank account almost mm. right okay. of trust and it's it, it it can get squandered real quick man it can get squandered real quick if you don't intentionally actively knowingly continue to build it with you with your troops or at home yeah right i mean it, it's one of those things that um it's like your your reputation right it, it takes an a, a a lifetime to develop and to establish and, and it can be destroyed in the matter of a, a, a one decision an instant yeah. right yeah that's an interesting uh you know, allegory, because unlike money, you know, that can come and go, but it's with trust. Yes, it's going to snowball either way. But you're right, like you make one bad call or one bad conversation, or you make a mistake, and you don't navigate that correctly, right? You don't take ownership. And yeah, like, how are you going to get trust in that bank account? It might be so little over so much time of you doing things 100% right, because there's nothing to base it off of, right? You're starting from scratch, you got to you know, you had like a boulder of a snowball, but you got to start with snowflakes. Right. And, 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 and I think a, a lot, no, and it makes sense. I think a lot of it though is, was the misstep, you know, you know, it, what did you do after the misstep? 
did you own up to it? Hey man, you know what? That was a bad call. I, uh, I fucked you on that one, brother. I apologize. I apologize. You know, Oh shit. You know, John Sarge is, you know, Eric's acknowledging that that was, you know, that was his bad. Your trust credit doesn't take a hit when you do that. Yeah. You've mitigated that damage by taking some ownership. Mm-hmm. But if I shift, focus, tap, dance, deflect, um, and start pointing fingers at all the other re- all the other reasons why that went to shit or it what it wasn't my fault, that digs me into a deeper deficit when it comes to trust. You know, I, I you can mitigate a bad decision by just owning it. Um, you don't, and um, that that'll be something where. For me, I think about times when bosses uh, had two two decisions to make. Yeah, I told him to do that, and it was my bad. Versus, I don't know who I don't know why he would do that. I don't, who who told John to do that? You know, like you motherfucker, yeah. right? And that mm-hmm. guy was dead to me as a leader. Mm-hmm. You're gonna you're gonna you're gonna hang me out to dry because you're not willing to take responsibility for a bad call. Yeah. And so I yep. think we don't have to look far for examples of in our own lives when somebody has just taken ownership and said, you know what? Hindsight. Yeah. I would, that was a bad call, you know, dealing with less than perfect information. It seemed like the right call at the time, but obviously it wasn't. You're all, you're all in. You're still, Hey, you're, st- you still got respect for that leader. You still trust that leader. Um, and I think that's probably some, a, a takeaway for our bosses. Like I've I've watched sheriffs not take ownership of shitty situations, mm-hmm. and it would it destroyed their credibility and their standing within the agency. Yeah, something it, something yeah. as simple as just saying, "Hey, yeah, I effed up. This one's on me." It fractures the department, right? And then that's where you have you have attrition. You have. Uh what's that absenteeism, right? When people are checked out, but they're still around. And so that, sure. what does that do for your culture, right? That's so toxic and corrosive too. And yeah, you're absolutely right. And I, you know, not so long ago, I did a post writing just that, right? Leaders say sorry. And the point was like, yeah, it's nothing profound that I invented, but if you think about it, you know, like the best bosses you've ever had or the best even, you know, team leaders or peer leaders, you know, informal leaders, like they're humble. They, they fall on their sword, not just like, hey, I own it, because some of us are good at saying that, but not really going any deeper than that. But right. to say, yeah, here's what I did. Here's where it led me there. And here's what I intend to do. Right. And that's the same for any leader, right? Parents. Um, but yeah, bosses of all types. But you can also think quickly about everyone can think quickly about bosses that they did not respect or bosses that were not effective leaders. And if you ask them, hey, did your did that person apologize? Can you think of a time? I would I bet a good amount of money, and I'm not a gambler, but I get bet a good amount of money that they would say, no, I can't think of a single time that they outwardly publicly said, you know, even if it's not like public public, but it's like to a person or right. a group of people, like, yeah, my bad, I, my yeah, bad, I'm you know, sorry. It's, Eric, it, it's so foundational mm-hmm. to good leadership. Listen, I always now. I don't want to make this a political podcast, but can I use an analogy with our former Please. President Trump? Sure. So uh, I think if if he there are some characteristics that he uh, are, that are completely foreign to him. One is humility. Mm. I, I think that if if he just had a little humility and would take a little ownership um, on some of the things that are divisive and, and, and just, and just, Hey, you know what? It was a, it wasn't a good tactic and it, it, it's created more problems for our country than it solved. Sure. And I, and I want to, I want to do better at connecting. So the, so half of this country can trust me. Mm-hmm. You would listen, yeah. you would have a, a vast majority of this country going, that that actually sounds like some common sense stuff that somebody that actually gives a shit would say. Yeah. And but you know, you gotta have that mechanism, man. You gotta have the ability to uh be uh be humble. And I, I just don't 
<laughs> Unfortunately, man, I just don't think that's a button on his uh, on his radar, man. Yeah, but, I don't think that was polarizing. I really hope that that cop, you know, whether Trump supporters or non supporters or anti, you know, anti. I think most people would agree that the ego is a factor. Uh, right. But I think you'll have some uh, really if Joe Biden came disagree. out and said, "You know what? Uh, I, I am getting forgetful, and I, uh, you know, I, I've got to, you know, I've got to up my game, and I, you know, what? I, it, just fucking be real. Like, I be people would be like." Yeah, be like, yeah, man. Um, yeah, and and I'm, you know, hey, I'm fucking whatever. I'm, whatever, whatever his age is. I don't know what his age is. Um, yeah. but you know, I uh, I gotta, I gotta start working on functional fitness and you know, stretching it. You know, he could make a joke of it, but he sure. could acknowledge that he's not as spry as he was instead of all the distraction and the nonsense. And then people would actually go. You know what, man? He is getting up there, but you know, you know, he's 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 being human. Um, yeah, I, I don't know, bro. Maybe I, I don't know what the hell I'm talking about, but it no, just... it's totally relevant. And because literally today, at the time of this recording, I posted a reel where I was just recording myself, and it was because uh, when I recorded it just prior, there's a dude that kind of waved me down and said, "Hey, hey, you're gonna go crush it today," and I was in uniform. I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm going to crush that paperwork. And, you know, he, we're kind of laughing about it. He's like, no, I just really want to say, hey, thanks for what you do. Uh, you know, it's rough out there. And, you know, you guys have been through a lot in the last couple of years. I was like, yeah, but it's getting better. And I was kind of like trying to get my car. And he's like, hey, uh, you know, I really appreciate you. I just appreciate the heck out of you and your team. He's like, well, that doesn't mean I don't think that a lot of you are a bunch of beep. And I was like, yeah. and I, so my reaction was, you know, he was smiling when he said it. And my reaction, yeah. I just started chuckling. I was like, hey, man. Uh, a lot of cops don't like a lot of cops. And I think that's okay, right? And <laughs> right. then he just started laughing, right? Because he didn't expect it, but he's like, no, but for real, like, you guys you guys be safe. And uh, so awesome, I shared man. that because... Well, you know yeah, what? Because you like, acknowledged... Well, you acknowledge yeah. you, you weren't like, oh, nobody talks. No, there are dudes that I work with that I'm ashamed I worked with. For sure. And I think it's that like, anyone, people. yeah. And that's right. for like, that's that trust thing. And, and like, we're we should be leaders in the community people do look to us in times of crisis sure. right and we do they do expect even if they don't like us even if they're apprehensive they expect us to have extreme legal knowledge which they should they expect right. us to have utmost integrity which they should right they expect right. us to yeah. be able to do the hard thing when no one else wants to which they should that's part of the job so right. yeah we should be leaders and so in that we should yeah. be humble and we should not take ourselves too seriously and just be no nope. just be nope. human at times and that's exactly yeah. what that was trying to be that sounded like a, a really a great interaction because I can tell you had you had you not engaged him the way you did with acknowledging like yeah man there we got some winners man that's it's being truthful it it, yeah. it ups your street cred right you know yeah, what I mean absolutely. it does yeah, yeah. And, I, a, and I stole it's a it was a more polite version that I stole from a an officer I worked for years and years and years, but he used to say a more harsh version, which is a uh, he's it, hey, it's okay. I, I don't like half the people I work with. Like he used to right. say it so quick, and he'd say it all yeah, the time. Man. And I was like, okay, that's a little rough because he, I think he was kind of serious too. Uh, but yeah, right, that's funny. Shout out to yeah, the local peeps will know probably exactly who I'm talking about. That's funny. Yeah, man. But, uh, I think the other yeah. the other thing too, Eric is um, we're not different than the public. Like we, you know, we are the public. Yeah. Right. And so do we have, do we get called to do different, you know, different things from time to time? Yeah, absolutely, man. Um, but you know, our, our job doesn't make us better than anybody. No. You know, and, um, what ends up happening is, you know, you start believing that you're better and that widens the, the, the divide. You know, and uh, when we start taking the human element out of it, we start losing empathy and compassion and perspective. And then I think also, you know, that that ends up creating problems for us, you know, not only in in the performance of our jobs, but just from a character standpoint. Yeah. Yeah. We shouldn't be better than anyone. And uh, we're all we're all people doing this thing. Uh, a lot of us, the best we can, the best we know how, and we all have our stumbling blocks, right? I, I, we'd be remiss to, 
I, I really hope that there's no cop out there that's like, no, I had it all together all the time, every single day since I became a cop. Yeah. No, you haven't. Uh, you know, uh-huh. like no person. And so it's really hard to serve people if you think you're better than them, you know, whether, right. you know, you're wiping down tables or what have you. Like, Dude, that's the job. There, like, there is no job, that. right? I mean, listen, alcoholic, addict, adulterer, you know, I'll stop at the A's, bro. You know, I'll stop at the A's, you know, it's, um, I think the, the 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 measure or the definition needs to be what you do after that failure, right? Mm-hmm. What you do after the stumble or the fall. I think that's that that should be more defining than the actual fall, right? Shouldn't yeah. it be? Yeah, yeah. And it's a lot of what I what I talk about. I found more confidence uh, with my time and my perhaps my age and maturity, perhaps because, you know, my, I've been able to grow my career where I, I, maybe that's a factor, right? I feel a little bit more comfortable at command level saying, Hey, like I've made mistakes as an officer, uh, you know, that I, I'm not certainly proud of. And I think I would have been a better cop sooner if I would have recognized some of those things and been able to share that. Right. So going back to our conversation yeah. earlier, like it's just to share, like share experience so that everyone can learn from our mistakes. Right. So they can have wisdom. Whereas like our learned mistakes and process, like that's, you know, trial by trial by fire. Like that's not the best path to wisdom. No, no. And, and, I, and I think, I think a lot of that just kind of circling back to, you know, why I'm doing what I'm doing. I wish I had somebody like me yelling at me. Mm. I, I had nobody yelling at me, man. I had nobody saying, Hey, don't do that. Do this. Um, you know, and if this happens, there's a way, there's a pathway forward, and here's how. Uh, so much of it was trial and error. Um, not to say that there, was, there wasn't there was support, because there was support, but it was well after the fact, right? So I think the goal now is proactive engagement and getting guys and girls to live their lives a certain way so that when they do fall or they do hit some speed bumps, they actually know what it's like to be resilient. Like you don't become resilient in the moment. That's not that's not something that like well, I'm, like you take a vitamin in the morning and now you're resilient. It's a, it's the way you live your life. It's the things that you incorporate over time period X that prepare you to thrive. Had you not done those things, right? I mean, so I, I think, you know, talking about resiliency and mindfulness and peak performance and all these, you know, it's great buzzwords, man, but like, how do we achieve that? How do we get there? And I think that's the biggest difference generationally. Um, my generation is waiting for the crash uh, to help. We want you to hit the wall. We want you on fire, rolling around uh, in the infield, you know, and Mm -hmm. we're going to send some people over to to put you out. I think your generation is like, listen, that's, that's stupid. Why are we waiting? Let's get involved or let's identify where we're failing. Let's identify the areas that are problematic and let's start doing something proactive to address it. So you don't ever crash. And I think that that's, that's, that's just a winning formula and it's taken years, years of doing the same thing and expecting a different result for people to finally wake up and go, all right, there's a better way. And uh, that, that's why, you know, that's what, that's the, that's what you're a part of now. That's what I'm a part of right now. Um, Trying to, be proactive in a sense of self-care that has, I think, eluded us for the vast majority of at least my life. Yeah, it's still a work in progress for sure. I, I mean, there's so much good work uh, being done, and I feel uh, very humbled to be a part of it, you know, amongst people like yourself. At the same time, you know, there is a, a change of direction, right? There, there are people of your generation recently retired or close to retirement that you know, in my own agency and regionally are saying, Hey, I wish we had more of this stuff than, you know, when I, when I was younger, right. We'd be in a different place, meaning the culture and meaning like their friends, uh, 
but you know you say my generation it's still it's still a mixed bag and you know i'm i'm like a wellness person at my department but you know i don't have all the buy in you know and so certainly when i have this podcast where i talk about things a lot of it's you know the things that we're trying to figure out how to how to change culture how to keep breeding that but it really has to be so abundantly saturated that everywhere you look or listen you're you're hearing things about wellness and how officers and first responders can care for each other and themselves but you know we have at the top my chief's like yeah work out on duty uh and then at command level i'm like yes please find a way to have your guys work out on duty but it's competing right because it's the stuff is busy and there are some sergeants that are like okay cool i'm going to try to make it a priority and other sergeants are like i'd love to boss but we can't hold in calls right and so it's even hard to socialize where some officers squeeze it in others are like i don't want to I don't want to be that person that, you know, isn't answering at first for the call because I'm pretty new. I don't want to be judged. So not to point fingers, they're just these layers of complexity with culture change. And I recognize it's gradual. And from talking to one of my mentors, uh, I feel this impatience inside me. And I'm not I'm not trying to quell it too much. I'm trying to just be mindful of it. Uh, But it it is a yeah, I'm reminded it's a long game to socialize and and really make these part of like our permanent natural culture right yeah listen there's always going to be obstacles right always going to be obstacles um but as long as there's more opportunities than obstacles or as long as we look at those obstacles as opportunities i guess that's probably said better that way um we can move the needle gradually listen we didn't get messed up overnight we're not going to get fixed overnight and uh, uh, we want that immediacy right we know what needs to get done to get fixed uh there are going to be there are people in this profession that still subscribe um to the theory of well uh, i'm grown i'll figure it out and you know historically we know that that doesn't always work out well for us that asking for help is not a sign of weakness. It's it's a sign that you're actually extremely intelligent, right? Yeah. That, like you, you're self-aware that you are like, you know what, man? Yeah, I I want some guidance on this one. And so um, there'll always be those that get burned because, you know, they don't believe you that after you've told them that the stove is hot, right? They're like, well, I don't, be- you know, you're full of shit. I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and touch the stove. And they're going to get burned and then they're going to go, "All right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good call, man. You were right." But I think if there's a pendulum that's swinging, I think more people are now open to because we've seen the data. We 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 don't have, you know, we're a living breathing organization where we can look at the, the and take the pulse of what's working and what's not right? From leadership to self-care. And so there are a bunch of things that are working in the self-care space um, and how we go about communicating and interacting with each other. Uh, We've seen what doesn't work. Now we're starting to see what things do work and we're starting to implement them. And so I think, listen, man, it's, it's, it's an exciting time, you know, for all the ills, for all the woes, um, regionally, I'll say regionally, because um, the issues that other areas are facing, there are other areas in the country that are thriving. That cops, cops, not only can they not go in their pocket and, and pay for a lunch or a cup of coffee because it's already been taken care of. That's not like a one-off. That is a daily occurrence uh, in cops' lives. in in many jurisdictions. So I I think it's, you know, you start, we we look at what happened with New York uh, recently in the news, you you know, Mm -hmm. you've got uh, um, NYPD is like constantly under attack. If not from the, not, if not from citizens or illegals from their own command, right? I mean, it just, these men and women are constantly getting their asses handed to them by people that shouldn't have any standing. Um, you see the couple cops tussling with uh, uh, four or five guys, uh, illegals. It doesn't matter who they are. Sure. Nobody should be fighting with the cops, one. Yeah. And then uh, on the heels of that, 
you know, they come out with a big statement about, you know, we're going to, we're going to tighten up. We're going to go back to, you know, our old school ways. Yeah. You, you saw this, right? No beards. No beard. No you knit, lost knit caps your unless mind. it's 32 degrees. Yeah. Like, what Listen, is the, what this is, is the, what we're talking about. Old yeah, what's school? The goal? You, know, you know what old yeah. school is, Eric? Let me tell you what old school is. Old school is you don't disrespect cops. Old school is you actually fear the cops. Old school is if you swing on a cop, you end up going to the hospital. That's old school, mm-hmm. right? You want to get back to old school. Let's get back to a time where if you took a swing at a cop, you ended up going to the hospital. That's old school. We They're talking about old school with no beards and we're going to cover up tattoos and button up your collar. There is such a disconnect. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, what's the, on, what's on, the goal? Yeah. And uh, yeah, I posted about that recently. And, you know, at the time of this recording, it's, uh, you know, start of February, essentially. But yeah, uh, it's more of like a symptom of an issue, right? And that's, it's you know, the, the comments are, you know, oh, yeah, great way to improve morale. And yeah, because there's, because you guys are having so many uh, successes hiring people to do this, this hard job, yeah. especially at NYPD. Yeah, it's, it's just like one I mean, more just, thing. Let's just let's just say let's just say recruitment wasn't an issue, and re- retaining uh, retainment wasn't an issue. Let's just say it was not an issue. What's the goal? What? How does that yeah. add value to anyone's life? And how? You know, I, I I got I took offense, man. When anybody says old school, like I remember what old school was. You know, I'd like to think I did. Uh, and I'm sure there's a generation listening to me going, well, I was a cop in the eighties. So you have no idea what old school was, and, sure, you yeah. know, and, and, and I was running around during McDuffie in the Mariel boat lift. So you don't know what old school, but for, for the argument, I think, and you know, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to pivot a little bit when it comes to, we have gotten away from doing the job to, to the point where we're no longer feared. Look, there's fear and respect, I think, go hand in hand, right? Um, it doesn't mean that you're nasty to people. It, it just means that they don't feel comfortable attacking you. How about that? Um, mm-hmm. Having a profession where you think twice, right now, there's no consequences for suspects' actions against law enforcement. I was talking uh, with Megan McCarthy out in San Berardino County Mm -hmm. um, attacked. She got fucking ragdolled, tattooed. Uh, Suspect blows a round off at her. Acquitted, not guilty. Jury nullification. We don't like cops. Not allowed to give a victim impact statement. What? Yeah. Judge tells tells her she's not a victim, Eric. So we've got a time here where it's, it's, it's upside down world. Um, there is no rule of law. We've been tasked with doing things that are so far outside the, the, the the job description of actually enforcing the law that the public, there are segments of the public that are absolutely comfortable with taking the fight to cops because they know, well, even if I get caught, that there's likely going to be no consequences for my actions. Yeah, that's exactly it. It's, uh, you know, it's not like for anyone listening that's like, well, you want to be feared. It's like, no, I I don't need to be feared as a person, but respect comes with uh, recognition of the institutions that we all are tacitly agreeing to by living in a society with law and order. Right. And years ago, I'm going to agree to disagree, Eric. I I love your brother, but there's nothing wrong with being feared. There, There really isn't. Because guess what? Law-abiding people don't fear you. Right. They, there's, there's no right. reason for them to fear you. Do you understand the concept? Yeah. And that's the audience I, I, I'm speaking to. I don't yeah. imagine any criminals are listening to this. But No, of course not. But I think we have gotten somehow fear, respect, has gotten a bad rap in all of this. You know, we need to be dancing on TikTok and, and, and doing backflips and wearing funny costumes. Um. It, that just that just drops us down another peg on the ladder where, um, you know, anything goes. I listen when I get pulled over, infrequent as it may be, I still get nervous, bro. Yeah, I too. still get nervous, mm-hmm. right? And I, you know, 
I'm doing 15 over. You know, I I'm like, oh, what's the matter? You know, what are you you're killing me? I thought I thought we'd give him 15. No, 10? Okay. Um, but I still my heart goes, ah shit, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, that's not a bad thing, man. A healthy, healthy dose of fear and respect, I think, keeps everybody honest. Well, it's consequence, and that's what I was yeah, getting man. at is, you know, yeah. when you are in society where there's no consequences and, you know, to varying degrees, depending on state and county and all that, right? But what is what is the consequence? And a lot of times there would be, you know, we'd be interacting with criminals or felons where it's it's fight or flight or comply because they're sizing you up. They're like, I don't think I can fight because there's too many of you or you're, I'm smaller than you, or I don't think I can flight because you're watching me so closely and you look like you're pretty fit. Like you, you weigh out your options. Right. And so right. when there is no fear of consequences because it's proven and people talk, people watch the news and you know, out here in Washington, the, it's a very limited pursuit policy still. Right. And then the legislation yeah. originally was a thing. And then, you know, just in last week, you know, and you could probably say every week, there's someone that takes off from, my guys, even in just my city, and then they just basically say, "Yeah, it's stolen car. Okay, yeah, it's taken right. off. I'm not pursuing." They're not allowed to. If they were to follow to any degree, and something happens, like they broke the the officer broke the law. Sure. And like no. there's a lot They're of debate hook. with what to pursue for or not, but just to blanketly say no, like we're seeing the repercussions, right? So it's not. I'm not trying to say anything crazy political. Like it, I think the right. average person is recognizing it's not working. No, I mean. Eric, there was a time, I, I told the story the other day, it was Martin Luther King's birthday, I was in the northwest section of Fort Lauderdale back in the early 90s, and there was a block party. Now, when I mean a block party, I mean 500 people in the street, and we had to walk in, me and one other guy, my partner Dennis, walked in to get to the DJ booth, because we're shutting it down. The only two white guys for as far as the eye could see. And we walked in. Hey, my man, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. Time to wrap it up. He huffed and puffed. I said, or I can just take your equipment with me and you can get it at the tow yard, you know, tomorrow. I said, your call, brother man. And guess what? We closed the party down. Mm. Hey, folks, you got to get going. You you know, we got to clear the streets. Two guys. We didn't get rocked and bottled. Right. Yeah. We didn't get we, we our cars didn't get set on fire. Our windows weren't smashed. Tires weren't flattened. We walked through the crowd, letting people know that they couldn't block the street anymore. And it was time to go. Not because we were superhuman. They knew the crowd knew what was expected of them. And they knew that there would be consequences had they not complied with our just a very nice, you know, walk through the crowd. Hey, let's wrap it up. Um, the, the, the wrath of God would descend upon that block. Should things go sideways. Uh, and not just for that night, but for every night into, uh, oblivion, right? right? The guys and girls doing the job can't do that nowadays because there's absolutely no fear of consequences. And I think, that, that that makes your job and the guys and girls doing that job 10 times harder than I ever had it. Yeah, um, absolutely. And it, and it is a good conversation because here we are where things are slightly getting better, right? You know, we're in 2024 now, and I think most of us can recognize that since 2020, we're in a better spot than we were in 21, 22, 23. However, there's a long way to go, right? And it's literally for the purpose of safer communities. And we need to work on public trust and we need to work on communication, right? Inside the PD, outside the PD. And so, you know, one thing that one thing I want to ask you, I want to be mindful of time is that, you know, with your shift in helping people be better, right? Helping them unlock. And that's like a, a, a word that's popping out in my brain as you continue to talk about your work is, you know, your focus wasn't on building connection back then, but it was. And so I'm curious what led you to that? Because I almost imagine this. Yeah, as police officers, we've developed all these skills and all these abilities to relate. And then so once you shift that attention, I, I picture this like floodgate opening of this potential to connect with people. You know what, Eric? Absolutely. So I was really, 
I was an exceptional communicator at work, like that story I just told you. There would there was no situation that I could be put in that I couldn't handle, connect, overcome, devise a plan, a solution. Um, I really that was I prided myself on my ability to connect with people, regardless of ethnicity. It was right. I did that at at the expense of ever really being able to connect with myself or knowing myself. Um, I spent thirty years being awesome at a job, and and really at the expense of me ever practicing any of those skill sets in my own personal life. And so the, you know, this epiphany is you can have both, man, you can be awesome at work and be really an amazing father, husband, wife, spouse, whatever you want to be. You can have both, but you need to be intentful. You need to, you need to make it a priority. And so what ends up happening is in this second chapter, I, I've realized all those kind of op- missed opportunities, if you will. It's really about like the book, you know, surviving self-inflicted wounds, right? A, a, a life of redemption. It's yeah. about it's about trying to pay it forward, acknowledging that, you know, maybe perfect doesn't exist, but just, you know, trying to be better today than you were the day before. I think that, that that's the key, man. The key is acknowledging that you know life's gonna throw shit at you man it's just just the way it is it ebbs and flows good days and bad but if we can make ourselves a priority which is something that i've never did over the 30-year career if we can make ourselves a priority if we can do something for ourselves every day if we can express gratitude if we can be mindful and show love and appreciation to the people that are in our lives now then that value that we add to our own lives, it, it touches everybody that we come in contact with. Uh, it, it, we're, if we're better at home, we're truly better at work. We're better officers. We're better servants of the community. And I think that that was a missing piece during my time in, in law enforcement. And that's why I'm so passionate about trying to deliver that message now to the folks that are still in it so they can. Um, they can live a life worth living, man. Yeah, I love that. And, you know, you can have both. And I think that's a that's a very valuable phrase to focus on because it is, right? It's a mindset shift. You know, you talked earlier about, hey, you know, you'd sign up for this job, just resign to having, you know, a heart condition and not enough time to work out and your, your kids hate you and all this stuff. Like you could resign your fate or you can take ownership and take agency and I love how you said, because I would have said it if you didn't, right? You, we have to have and adopt the belief that, and the recognition, rather, that if we are better at taking care of ourselves, we will be better at home and better at for our job, right? Because we could be 100%. a performer at work, but that, you're going to redline and burn out, right? And you won't be able to show that compassion, right? You're going to have compassion fatigue, all the things we talk about. Now, when you found that recognition, what I want to ask is, what helped you start in that direction and build momentum to where you are now in retirement, semi-retirement, because you're, you're yeah, staying right? busy, but thriving. You're staying busy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's um, fortunately, for, listen, f- for me, one thing about me is that once I identify the problem, I commit to the solution. I, I didn't always do that. I, 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 would, I would actually do the opposite, Eric. I, I would literally, in some cases, run away from the problem. And that was that was a, a, a something that only developed over experience. Like, I look, how did it work out when I didn't address these issues, when I ran from them? It actually magnified, it compounded mm-hmm. the issues to a point where they were almost, o- almost took, took control of my life. A, a, a real brief aside, my relationship at home, I never really put the effort in that it deserved. I never communicated, and so it got to a point where uh, I was having problems. I was having problems with my wife in, in, in the fact that I never communicated with her. Things got so bad, Eric, that I actually I stepped out on my, my wife. I actually I went out, I had an affair. You know, that was the shame of that, right? And the, the ripple effect and the damage that that caused. It's something I almost killed myself over, right? And so like it took me because I'm a knucklehead, man. It took me getting to that place to realize um, 
that if you don't do all these things that you know you should be doing, you can put yourself in a position to ultimately not care about yourself uh, in a very definitive, you know, final way. And so I'm a student of history, man. I like to say I, I make I make a lot of mistakes, but I only make them once, man. And so if I uh, I've been with Mrs. Kelly, it'll be 29 years this March, yes. and she, you know. Despite my best efforts, I like to say to destroy my my marriage, she wouldn't let that happen. And so when I learn a life lesson, Eric, the thing that I think has made me somewhat successful is I, I don't, I, I, when I learn the life lesson, I, I immediately adapt, pivot, and employ that knowledge to keep from falling. Hey, do I have good days and bad? Are there some times, you know, that uh, I fail? Even now in this second chapter, absolutely. But there's an awareness now that I didn't have before. And that awareness allows me to be proactive in doing all the things that I know I need to do to be successful, not only in my relationships with my family, but my relationships with with people I encounter and friends. Well, John, I, I appreciate that vulnerability. And I know you share about your story and your your stumblings in, in your book, right. And in your content. And so that's so huge. You know, you talk about committing, right. Commit to fixing it, commit to, as we said earlier, being uncomfortable. Right. And I, I really appreciate what you're doing for the culture, for the community, uh, for our, our community, as far as sharing all that and helping people recognize their best because it is necessary and we need just more and more of it, you know, as I talk to, you know, people in our spheres that are doing this type of work or hopping on, you know, podcasts or writing a book or and you're doing all the things, we just need more. So I greatly appreciate your time. Thank you for sharing it with, with us, all of us. Um, and it'll be in the show notes too, but for the listeners, where can they find you, get in contact with you? Oh, thank you, Eric. Um, I, I guess the easiest way is to go to the website, lawenforcementlifecoach.com. I, I, it could have been smaller. Don't ask me w- w- what the hell I was thinking, but it's lawenforcementlifecoach.com. And um, that's really the best way. It has all my contact information. And um, I'm active, very active on LinkedIn and Facebook. Uh, I really just appreciate, I'd like to say, just take a second to thank you for um, what you're doing. It's, uh, these are troubling times, but I am, so optimistic that with people like you uh, in the fight, man, we're going to get through this storm uh, better than we had ever imagined. So I, again, thank you for your time. And I appreciate you having me on your show, Eric. Thank you, man. Yeah. It's I'm humbled to be a part of it. And yeah, I, I really appreciate the connection and we'll keep building. We'll do what we have to do. Sounds good, brother. Thank you for tuning into another episode of blue grit radio. As always, support this community by subscribing, giving us a five-star review, and following, liking, and sharing posts on Blue Grit Wellness on Instagram. You can reach me there or email me at bluegritwellness at gmail.com. Be well and stay gritty.